The 6,191st meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is before the Council in document S slash agenda slash 6,191, which reads, quote, maintenance of international peace and security, nuclear proliferation, and nuclear disarmament. Unless I hear any objection, I shall consider the agenda adopted. Agenda is adopted. I wish to warmly welcome the distinguished heads of state and government, the general, uh, the secretary general, the director general of the IAEA, ministers and other distinguished representatives present in the Security Council chamber. Your presence is an affirmation of the importance of the subject matter to be discussed. Uh, the Security Council summit will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. Members of the Council have before them document S slash 2009 slash 473, which contains the text of a draft resolution prepared in the course of the Council's prior consultations. I wish to draw Council members' attention to document S slash 2009 slash 463, containing a letter dated 16 September 2009 from the United States of America, transmitting a concept paper on the item under consideration. In accordance with the understanding reached earlier among members, the Security Council will take action on the draft resolution before it prior to hearing statements from the Secretary General and Council members. Accordingly, I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S slash 2009 slash 473 please raise their hand. The results of the voting is as follows. Uh, the draft resolution is received. Unanimously, 15 votes in favor. Uh, the draft uh, resolution has been adopted unanimously as Resolution 1887 of 2009. I want to thank again everybody who is in attendance. I wish you all good morning. In the six-plus decades that this Security Council has been in existence, only four other meetings of this nature have been convened. I called for this one so that we may address, at the highest level, a fundamental threat to the security of all peoples and all nations, the spread and use of nuclear weapons. As I said yesterday, this very institution was founded at the dawn of the atomic age, in part because man's capacity to kill had to be contained. And although we averted a nuclear nightmare during the Cold War, we now face proliferation of a scope and complexity that demands new strategies and new approaches. Just one nuclear weapon exploded in a city, be it New York or Moscow, Tokyo or Beijing, London or Paris, could kill hundreds of thousands of people, and it would badly destabilize our security, our economies, and our very way of life. Once more, the United Nations has a pivotal role to play in preventing this crisis. The historic resolution we just adopted enshrines our shared commitment to the goal of a world without nuclear weapons, and it brings Security Council agreement on a broad framework for action to reduce nuclear dangers as we work toward that goal. It reflects the agenda I outlined in Prague and builds on a consensus that all nations have the right to peaceful nuclear energy, that nations with nuclear weapons have the responsibility to move toward disarmament, and those without them have the responsibility to forsake them. Today, the Security Council endorsed a global effort to lock down all vulnerable nuclear materials within four years. The United States will host a summit next April to advance this goal and help all nations achieve it. This resolution will also help strengthen the institutions and initiatives 
that combat the smuggling, financing, and theft of prolifer uh, proliferation-related materials. It calls on all states to freeze any financial assets that are being used for proliferation, and it calls for stronger safeguards to reduce the likelihood that peaceful nuclear weapons programs can be diverted to a weapons program. That peaceful nuclear programs can be diverted to a weapons program. The resolution we pass today will also strengthen the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. We have made it clear that the Security Council has both the authority and the responsibility to respond to violations to this treaty. We've made it clear that the Security Council has both the authority and responsibility to determine and respond as necessary when violations of this treaty threaten international peace and security. That includes full compliance with Security Council resolutions on Iran and North Korea. Let me be clear, this is not about singling out individual nations. It is about standing up for the rights of all nations who do live up to their responsibilities. The world must stand together, and we must demonstrate that international law is not an empty promise and that treaties will be enforced. The next 12 months will be absolutely critical in determining whether this resolution and our overall efforts to stop the spread and use of nuclear weapons are successful. And all nations must do their part to make this work. In America, I have promised that we will pursue a new agreement with Russia to substantially reduce our strategic warheads and launchers. We will move forward with the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and open the door to deeper cuts in our own arsenal. In January, we will call upon countries to begin negotiations on a treaty to end the production of fissile material for weapons. And the Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference in May will strengthen that agreement. Now, we harbor no illusions about the difficulty of bringing about a world without nuclear weapons. We know there are plenty of cynics and that there will be setbacks to prove their point. But there will also be days like today that push us forward, days that tell a different story. It is the story of a world that understands that no difference or division is worth destroying all that we have built and all that we love. It is a recognition that can bring people of different nationalities and ethnicities and ideologies together. In my own country, it has brought Democrats and Republican leaders together, uh, leaders like George Shultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, who are with us here today. And it was a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, who once articulated the goal we now seek in the starkest of terms. I quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And no matter how great the obstacles may seem, we must never stop our efforts to reduce the weapons of war. We must never stop until all, we must never stop at all until we see the day when nuclear arms have been banished from the face of the earth. That is our task. That can be our destiny. And we will leave this meeting with a renewed determination to achieve this shared goal. Thank you. In accordance with the understanding reached among Council members, I wish to remind all speakers to limit their statements to no more than five minutes in order to enable the Council to carry on its work ex expeditiously. Uh, delegations with length lengthy statements are kindly requested to circulate the text in writing and to deliver a condensed version when speaking in the chamber. I shall now invite the distinguished Secretary General, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished heads of state and government, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. This is a historic moment, a moment offering a fresh start toward a new future. President Obama, a warm welcome, and we salute your leadership. This is the first Security Council summit on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. I have long advocated a stronger role for the Security Council. This was a major element of the five-point nuclear disarmament plan I announced October last year. The need for action is clear. The thousands of nuclear weapons remain on hair trigger list, a lot. More states have sought and acquired them, nuclear tests, 
have continued. And every day, we live with the threat that weapons of mass de destruction could be stolen, sold, or slip away. As long as such weapons exist, so does the risk of proliferation and catastrophic use. So too uh, does the threat of nuclear terrorism. Now, some might dismiss the goal of nuclear disarmament as utopian. The cynics say, stop dreaming, be, be realistic. They are wrong. Nuclear disarmament is the only sane path uh, to a safer world. Nothing would work better in eliminating the risk of use than eliminating the weapons themselves. The Russian Federation and the United States are leading by example. I urge the Security Council to make the most of this moment. They should, be, they should not be a one-time event. We must sustain the momentum. First, we need to, new ways to increase the transparency and openness regarding the weapons programs of the recognized nuclear weapon states. I urge the Council to start consultation on this matter. The Secretariat is ready to serve as a repository. Second, we must make the best use of the UN's disarmament machinery. I hope, for example, that the Conference on Disarmament can advance the program of work it adopted this year, including negotiations on a fiscal material cutoff treaty. For its part, the Council could promote universal membership in key treaties, work to improve compliance, the assess the need, and assess the need for new agreements including a nuclear weapons convention. It could also strongly reaffirm the need early entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Third, disarmament and non-proliferation must proceed together. I encourage nuclear weapon states here to consider additional measures to enhance security as a way of leading to total elimination. These could include, for example, ways to achieve the effective verification of the disarmament process. At the same time, we must ensure that the IAEA has the resources and support it needs to implement its growing safeguard responsibilities. For too long, a divided international community has lacked the will, vision, and confidence to move ahead. Together, we have dreamed about a nuclear-free world. Now we must act to achieve it. That starts now. I congratulate the Council for convening this summit. I welcome the adoption of today's resolution. And I again salute the leadership of President Obama. I pledge my continued support and look forward to future meetings on these vital issues here in this Council and beyond, including the crucial 2010 NPT Review Conference. This summit truly adds a new page to the history of this Council. Let us now write a new chapter for peace, security, and safety for all. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the Secretary General for his statement. I invite the distinguished President of the Republic of Costa Rica, His Excellency Mr. Oscar Arias Sanchez, to take the floor. Muchas gracias, señor Presidente. Thank you. President, Secretary General, my friends, I welcome this opportunity to speak to you all in the place which is most emblematic of this era. The Security Council is a mixture of hope and fear, something that led to taking measures based on the promise that we would be able to sleep quietly after the most abominable war, the promise contained in Article 26 of the Charter of the United Nations, which says that the Security Council would promote the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security with the least diversion for armaments of the world's human and economic resources. That promise has not yet been kept. While we sleep, death is awake. There are areas where more than 23,000 warheads are being 
stockpiled as if it were 23,000 open eyes waiting for a slip. Those who are perfecting weapons of mass destruction, instead of destroying them every year, destine millions and billions of dollars to vertical proliferation. Fundamentalists, megalomaniacs, radicals, populists, who base their power on firepower. I am grateful to President Barack Obama for this opportunity to discuss the reduction of nuclear weapons in the world. A large number of Nobel Peace Prize winners have gone a step further. For years, we have been advocating the complete elimination of weapons of mass destruction because we believe that they run counter to the survival instinct of any species. But it doesn't seem reasonable to discuss disarmament at a time when even the existing arrangements are not being honored. So long as we have countries that refuse to ratify the NPT and the CTBT, while others conceal data, stockpile fissile material, and cheat international verification mechanisms, hiding behind sovereignty, so long as there are nuclear tests, so long as the Security Council remains silent while everybody knows. I am thinking, for instance, the clandestine network that was leaded by Abdul Qadir Khan from Pakistan with complete impunity in open mockery of Resolution 1540. It seems plausible to me to discuss a more safe world while there are other perennially dangerous weapons on item two of our agenda. This council fails to comply with its mandate every single day that it glosses over the arms race. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent daily on arms and soldiers. More than $42 billion are being spent on conventional weapons that are sold to developing countries, to weak democracies or non-existent democracies that cannot even meet the most basic needs of their own people. Even in Latin America, which has never been so democratic or peaceful, almost $60 million are going to be spent on weapons at a time when the average years of schooling is only seven and there is such poverty for millions of inhabitants. That is why I ask you to consider the treaty on the transfer of weapons that my delegation has presented to this organization. If we're really worried about terrorist networks having access to nuclear weapons, it's also legitimate for us to worry about rifles, grenades, machine guns which give power to these networks. Who said that killing thousands in one blow is worse than killing thousands one by one? Twenty years ago, I visited the United Nations during my first term as president. At that time, we talked about a world without warheads, a world in which we would finally control the weapons that fueled these fraternal, fratricidal wars. I'm coming back again as a Rip Van Winkle of the modern age to see that everything has changed except that peace is always just out of reach. Nuclear and conventional weapons remain despite all the promises made. It's up to us to make sure that 20 years hence we will not wake up to the same situation. I'm honored to see that the biggest nuclear weapons merchants in the world are here today. But I'm not talking to the weapons sellers today. I'm talking to the leaders of humanity, to those who have the responsibility of placing principle above utility and to create a world where we can finally sleep in peace. Thank you. I thank His Excellency President Arias Sanchez uh, for his statement. I now invite the distinguished President 
of the Republic of Croatia, His Excellency Mr. Stepan Mesic, uh, to take the floor. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to present on behalf of the Republic of Croatia the views on the issue that has been put on the agenda of today's session. I take this opportunity to pay tribute to the United States and to you personally, President Obama, for the initiative to discuss in the Security Council the very delicate issue of nuclear non-proliferation. If this session brings us just one step forward on the path towards a world free of nuclear weapons, a world that you, Mr. President Obama, have in a visionary manner set as the objective we should aspire to, then we have succeeded. I state even if we get one step, one single step closer to this objective, since the journey towards a world free of nuclear weapons is not, cannot be, and will not be easy, simple, or brief. This, however, does not mean that we should give up or allow despondency to master our thoughts or deeds. Quite the contrary. The world was faced with nuclear weapons 54 years ago, and the horrendous effects of their use imposed the need to start almost immediately to reflect on how to limit their proliferation, which was also the objective of a set of international treaties. However, in spite of all, today we live in a world where there are 10 or so nuclear powers, recognized or unrecognized. I sell deliberately powers since possession of a single nuclear bomb makes a country that possesses it a power if one considers the consequences of its potential use. To say nothing of the fact that the present-day world is burdened with the evil of international terrorism and what it would mean if some terrorist group were to get hold of nuclear weapons. What we should do here today, as my country sees it, is the following to reinforce the role of the United Nations, not having the least intention of replacing any institution or forum dealing with non-proliferation, and to indicate unanimously and jointly, and take into consideration the earlier documents of the Security Council and the General Assembly the following. On the one hand, greatest efforts are needed to reach first non-proliferation of nuclear weapons followed by nuclear disarmament. On the other hand, and at the same time, it is necessary to guarantee every country its right to the peaceful use of nuclear energy, if needed with even more stringent measures of universally accepted international control. Let me be more precise. We have to assist in affirming or establishing principles, principles that will help us to head towards a world free of nuclear weapons, and that in doing so we don't deal with this or that concrete issue. There is also another thing that we have to do first to support without any reservation a contractual multilateral system of control of nuclear weapons and disarmament which includes strict implementation and reinforced verification of contractual obligations and second call upon all members of the world organization to give their contribution to activities aimed at preventing the abuse of existing treaties and at strengthening anti-proliferation efforts and resources. The efforts focus first on limitation and then reduction of nuclear weapons and finally on disarmament have a long-standing history. They have, however, gained a new and strong impetus after the announcement by the US President that his final objective is a world free of nuclear weapons. As a result of that proclamation, our task today is to send a message to the world that has authorized us to act here that there is a political will for the pursuit of a policy providing security to all countries without nuclear weapons. 
thereby we shall also respond to long-standing efforts of participants of the Nuclear Free World campaign, where I include also the Secretary General as well as non-governmental organizations, civil society, current and former political leaders, parliamentarians and finally scholars, trade unions and students. Our objective is peace and security. This objective cannot be reached if the threat of nuclear weapons exists and the decades of the Cold War when admittedly, thanks to the balance of fear, we had global peace but not security are the best proof of it. The Republic of Croatia is prepared to give its maximum contribution to efforts aimed at achieving its, this objective. As a member of the generation having experienced the Second World War and remembering all later local wars and crises that threatened world peace, I can just add that this is something that we owe to those who come after us. When we leave, let us bequeath to them a better world, a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you. I thank His Excellency, uh, President Message, uh, for his statement. I now invite the distinguished president of the Russian Federation, His Excellency Mr. Dmitry uh, Atolievich Medvedev, to take the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I expect that the current meeting of the UN Security Council convened on the initiative of the US President Barack Obama will help address many problems in the international community, first and foremost in the sphere of nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament. I think that today it's obvious to all that the issues of security are uh, individual, visible, and global. And security is affected not only by conflict situations in certain regions of the world, but also by instability in individual countries. And if we want collective efforts of the international community to be built on objective forecasts and to be efficient, we must learn about each other and openly discuss the accumulated problems, comprehensively analyzing them and jointly developing well thought out decisions. It is precisely the goal of the UN Security Council resolution we've just adopted. The measure it contains a realistic program of action for the international community to efficiently respond to common threats in the nuclear sphere. Russia has always been a reliable and predictable partner in the area of nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament. In the limitation of Russia and the USA have carried out unprecedented reductions of strategic nuclear arsenals within the framework of the Treaty on the Reduction and Limitation of Strategic Offensive Arms. In doing so, we've repeatedly stated and reiterated our readiness to move forward to reduce the number of delivery vehicles of strategic offensive arms more than threefold. Our proposals have been tabled in negotiations that we're holding with the U.S. And uh, we are prepared to uh, work on all interested parties will uh, work with us. Today's uh, meeting is ushering in a time of large-scale and serious work, work that I am convinced will dramatically improve the situation in the world. I'm referring to the uh, Nuclear Security Summit and the NPT review conference scheduled for next year with the signing of a new legally binding Russian-American treaty on the reduction and uh, limitation of SOA. We're doing our utmost to have it uh, signed by December 2009. Our main uh, shared goal is to untie the problem knots in the field of nonproliferation and disarmament. Naturally, this can hardly, uh, this is complicated uh, since the level of distrust among nations remains too high, but it must be done. I would like to emphasize that the situation in the sphere of nonproliferation is changing more slowly than we would want. While the old traditional uh, threats persist and new ones are emerging. And one of the most dangerous threats that was just referenced by uh, certain heads of state is uh, nuclear components falling into the hands of terrorists. And I believe you would all agree that the existing backup system needs to be modernized. And we must think together how to make it more up to date and more efficient. Peaceful nuclear energy requires serious attention. Undoubtedly, the new NPPs are a key to resolving many problems 
of developing countries especially, and an incentive for economic growth of entire regions throughout the world and improvement of the living standard of millions of people on the planet. Yet the states that carry out such programs must strictly abide by non-proliferation agreements. And I specifically emphasize that here in the Security Council. Mm. What, in our view, are the priorities of international cooperation in this crucial area? There are a few of them. First, it is essential to collectively improve and strengthen the global regime of non-proliferation and disarmament. The tried and tested international mechanisms continue to play a pivotal role in this area. Above all, I'm referring to the fundamental nuclear non-proliferation treaty. We must also promote and universalize the system of IAEA safeguards. Second, we need to encourage early as possible ratification of the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty by leading countries that would ensure its entry into force. Finally, that's very important. A third, we should more actively use the new non-proliferation mechanisms. Uh, first of all, UN Security Council Resolution 1540, co-sponsored by Russia and the U.S. on non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism. And the final one, it's obvious that an effective solution of many of the aforementioned problems depends on the interested and constructive engagement of all parties. We expect that the Russian-American efforts in this area will be backed by all nuclear powers. The uh, non-nuclear states should also comply with their obligations in this area. And this would help them create a situation for a non-proliferation work. And finally, I would like to emphasize that Russia is ready to continue to work actively for peace on Earth and for the future of our civilization. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency President Medvedev for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished President of the United Mexican States, His Excellency Mr. Felipe Calderón Hinaosa, to take the floor. Thank you, President Barack Obama, President of the United States of America and President of the Security Council. To His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the Organization, distinguished heads of state and government, ladies and gentlemen, Mexico enthusiastically welcomes the United States' invitation to this meeting of the Security Council, this very special session on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Mexico is convinced that world peace and security cannot be built on an accumulation of nuclear arsenals. It's very encouraging that the United States and Russia, as we've heard, are negotiating a new strategic arms reduction treaty, precisely because the United States and Russia control 90% of the approximately 25,000 existing nuclear warheads. We believe that the final objective should be the total and complete elimination of nuclear weapons. My country is also gratified at the U.S. decision to resume the legislative process for the ratification of the Complete Test Ban Treaty, because that decision and the willingness to review models of deterrence that were raised in the recent past is an example that should inspire other countries to act in the same fashion. And similarly, we also value the decision to reconsider projects that just generate fear and doubt in humanity. Mr. President, we cannot accept the paralysis of the multilateral negotiations in the disarmament conference. The time has come to act. The draft resolution that has been negotiated in the Council and that we're adopting at this session should be the first step of a new movement in favor of disarmament. A growing number of states have developed nuclear weapons or have the capacity to produce them, ignoring the desires of countries that have established vast nuclear weapons-free areas, such as in Latin America and the Caribbean. The security of the entire planet is weakened to the extent that the number of possessors of such weapons grows. 
Mexico supports the right of every state to avail itself of nuclear energy for peaceful uses under the full supervision of the IAEA, which is represented here both from the gradual exhaustion of fossil fuel as well as by the effect this has on global warming. Nuclear energy is an opportunity for sustainable development for all, but it is only through incentives for the peaceful use of nuclear energy that we can avoid that those who covet nuclear arms should misuse them. They must abandon their intention to possess them. To this is added the risk that terrorist groups could acquire the equipment and technology to manufacture a nuclear artifact. And to avoid this, it is fundamental that all states comply with Resolution 1514 of the Security Council. To demonstrate Mexico's commitment, we have taken steps to join some of the international export control regimes, starting by the group of nuclear suppliers. We must redouble our efforts in favor of disarmament and non-proliferation without ceasing to promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Although nuclear disarmament is the central topic of this session of the Security Council, Mexico would also like to draw attention to the proliferation of conventional weapons. Trafficking in small arms and light weapons causes about a thousand deaths and 3,000 injuries every day in the world. Mexico urges the members of the Security Council to find ways to put brakes on this illicit trade without prejudice to the right of every state to buy the necessary weaponry for its legitimate defense and the protection of its citizens. My country considers that it is urgent that a treaty on weapons trade be negotiated within the United Nations. Mr. President, heads of state and government. Don Alfonso Garcia Robles, a Mexican who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize because he had been the architect and promoter of the first nuclear weapons free area in the world, in Latin America and the Caribbean, through the Tlatelolco Treaty, stated that our children have the right to demand that their parents hand down to them a world free of nuclear threats. 64 years later, we cannot burden the coming generations with this responsibility. It's time to move ahead, not only towards non-proliferation, but towards general and complete nuclear disarmament. There is no other way of proceeding. This is the avenue we must take. Thank you. Uh, I thank His Excellency. Mr. Calderon, for his statement. Uh, I invite the distinguished uh, federal president of the Republic of Austria, His Excellency Dr. Heinz Fischer, to take the floor. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today the Security Council of the United Nations pronounces its commitment to a world without nuclear weapons. For more than half a century, this goal has been pursued by concerned citizens and political leaders around the world. The international community has undertaken efforts to contain the threat, but many have adjusted to it, almost accepting the nuclear shadow as part of life. But any such complacency is ill-founded. We have arrived at a fork in the road. We can maintain our course and hope nothing happens, or we can seek real change. Future historians will assess whether today is a turning point. This will not depend on words spoken, but on the deeds that follow. In May 2010, the international community will convene at the NPT Review Conference in New York. There, we will have to agree on measures that enable progress towards a nuclear weapon-free world. For Austria, the following points are particular paramount. First, the prospect of a world without nuclear weapons must become a goal shared by all states. Austria supports the idea of a nuclear weapons convention equipped with a sophisticated verification mechanism. In the meantime, the NPT remains the core of the global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. But to fulfill its functions effectively, it must be strengthened, it must be institutionalized, and it must become universal. Second, 
The nuclear weapon states must reduce their arsenals. As you, Mr. President, noted in Prague, I quote, words must mean something. The words enshrined in Article 6 of the NPT have to be taken serious. There have been positive developments, yes, but nuclear weapon states must do more. Third, we must devise a process for entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Death Ban Treaty. Austria and Costa Rica, as co-chairs of Article 14's conference, worked hard to promote entry into force over the last two years. This will only be possible, however, with the political commitment of the states that still need to ratify. Fourth, we must enable the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva to negotiate a fissile material cut-off treaty. As current president of the conference, Austria will make every effort to promote this goal. But to achieve progress, the support of all its members is necessary. Fifth, our capabilities to prevent nuclear materials from proliferating to states and non-state actors must improve. Security Council Resolution 1540 needs better implementation. Austria welcomes its comprehensive review next week. Most importantly, we must enhance the International Atomic Energy Agency's monitoring and verification capabilities and ensure strict export control for sensitive material and technologies. In view of the presence of Director General El Barata here today, let me thank him warmly and very outspoken for his excellent work as head of the agency over the last 12 years in Vienna. Thank you. Six, finally, we must strengthen trust and confidence. Nuclear weapon-free zones contribute significantly to sustainable stability. Regions like the Middle East would benefit from such a regime. Ensuring that arms control mechanisms operate in a fair and transparent manner is crucial. Austria's proposal to multilateralize the nuclear fuel cycle under the control of the Atomic Energy Agency could help to avoid crises of trust, such as those with regard to the Iranian and North Korean nuclear <coughs> program. For clarification, I would like to underline that paragraph 11 of this resolution refers to those countries that have decided to use nuclear energy for peaceful energy reasons, what is not the case in Austria. Mr. President, Austria is very satisfied that this resolution we just adopted is a strong text, a positive contribution to the ongoing disarmament process. But resolutions are not enough. Every state must accept responsibility and active participation. And I promise Austria's support will be there. You can also count on the European Union with its well-known position on these issues and its deep commitment to strengthening the multilateral system. And we can rely on civil society, which throughout the years remained a motor behind disarmament efforts. Mr. President, today we have identified our goals for the future. We now need the energy, the commitment, and the persistence to move forward. The support by heads of state and government at this table today makes me confident that all together we can reach our goals. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency President Fisher for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished president of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, his Excellency, Mr. Nguyen Minh Triet, to take the floor. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Vietnam welcomes the initiative taken by President Barack Obama at the United States President of the Security Council in September 2009 to convene this summit at the Security Council on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Disarmament. The 20th century saw the birth of nuclear weapons and their deadly devastation. The century also witnessed an all-around nuclear arms race that not only increased tension in international life and wasted resources that could have otherwise been used for development but also posed 
to the entire world an unprecedented danger of extermin extermination. It was also the 20th century that witnessed a world movement with broad participation of governments, organizations, and individuals demanding the elimination of nuclear weapons, opposing nuclear war for the preservation of peace. Invented by man, but right since its birth, nuclear weapons have always been a threat to mankind itself and strongly rejected. Yet, there still exists a nuclear stockpile capable of destroying the entire world many times over. The situation of proliferation of nuclear weapons is undergoing new and complex developments. The risk of nuclear weapons falling into the hands of terrorist groups is increasing. Over the past decade, the world's military spending has increased by 45%, while expenditures for nuclear armament has been many times greater than that for Millennium De Development Goals, which we set to prevent, mitigate, among others, hunger, degradation of environment, adverse climate change, pandemics affecting the lives of billions of human beings. Vietnam supports all initiatives and proposals of international community to this end, including those contained in the position paper of the non-allied movement circulated for this summit and the five-point proposal of the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I'd like to take this opportunity to emphasize the following. Firstly, the pre prevention of nuclear war and nuclear disarmament leading to the total elimination of nuclear weapons continue to be the only aspiration and an urgent demand of mankind. Nuclear weapon states, military alliances, those countries with major military capabilities bear primary responsibilities. Vietnam shares the international community's desire for bilateral, multilateral, and multilateral plans for early substantial reduction of nuclear stockpiles and for the assurance of security for non-nuclear weapon states against the use and threat the use of nuclear weapons, we call for an early commencement of negotiations on international nuclear disarmament agreements in which those countries having the largest nuclear arsenals must take a leading role in nuclear disarmament because this is an urgent task to ensure the world peace. Secondly, effectiveness of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, including the strengthening of the authority of the International Atomic Agency Energy Agency, must be enhanced. This agency is mandated to prevent the risk of proliferation of nuclear weapons and to ensure nuclear safety and security as well as impartiality and equality among all states in accordance with the international law. The agreements on nuclear weapon free zones reflect the desire of states for and the right to use the reduction of the risk of nuclear war and constitutes contribution to the non-proliferation nuclear weapons. On this occasion, Vietnam calls for the state to support the protocol to the Treaty on the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Zone entered into force in 1997. Thirdly, the promotion and the use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes should, be, should constitute a solid pillar of nuclear non-proliferation regime. In this connection, Vietnam proposi proposes that international conference on the use of nuclear energy for peace purposes be convened for the exchange on the issues such as international coordination measures to support the development of policies, science, technology, and regulations aimed at nuclear safety and security. It is the consistent policy of Vietnam to oppose war and promote disarmament for the pro protection of peace. This policy reflects the earnest desire of the Vietnamese people who have always harbored peace but have suffered great losses from wars, and who therefore desire peace not only for themselves but for mankind. Vietnam is a party to all international treaties on prohib prohibition of weapons of mass destruction and is highly appreciated for the serious implementation of its commitments, including those under the Security Council resolutions. Men who invented nuclear weapons must bear the responsibility of eliminating them so that we can live in a peaceful world. Vietnam pledges to contribute its utmost to our common efforts to achieve this noble objective. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency President uh, Min Triet for his statement. I invite the distinguished President of the Republic of Uganda, His Excellency Mr. Yoweri Kaguta Boseveni, to take the floor. Uh, Mr. President, Excellencies, I will not read my statement because I, I will then repeat what the other leaders have said. 
Instead, I will make four points. Point number one, I thank President Obama for convening this special session of the Security Council to discuss this very important topic. Secondly, it is clear that the possession of nuclear weapons is the main cause of other countries wanting to, to acquire nuclear weapons. It is not logical to say that a few of us should possess nuclear weapons and others should not. I'm therefore very pleased to hear that some of these countries which have nuclear weapons are saying that they are aiming at getting rid of all the nuclear weapons. Action leads to reaction. Reaction leads to counter-reaction. So if you look at the history, how did it all start? Germany wanted nuclear weapons to dominate the world with those weapons. The United States beat Germany to those weapons first. <coughs> they used them. Then Soviet Union had to acquire the weapons in order to balance the United States. Then China and so on. So you can see that the main cause of nuclear, nuclear proliferation is actually the possession of those weapons. Number three, the NPT is based on three principles which I think are very good. Non-proliferation, non disarmament, and peaceful use of nuclear energy. Now, finally, I want to inform this Security Council that Africa is interested not in nuclear weapons, but in nuclear energy. The reason we are interested in nuclear energy is that if you take all the rivers in Africa, the total capacity of the hydropower there is about 300,000 megawatts. We are going to be 1.3 billion Africans by 2020. Now, if you take the United States, who are only 300 million people, they are now using 1 million megawatts. But all the rivers in Africa have got a potential of only 300,000 megawatts. Even if all the sites on the African rivers were developed, we would not have enough electricity to support the Africans. Unless, of course, you say that it has been scientifically proved that Africans don't need electricity. <laughs> but if you, don't, if, you don't, if you do not take that absurd co conclusion, then it is clear that Africa need, will have to use all sources of energy, including nuclear energy. Some people are talking of solar energy, but a, a, a kilowatt hour of solar energy is now at about 40 American cents. Yet a kilowatt hour of uh, nuclear or hydro is about five, four, six cents. So therefore, nuclear energy is of great interest to Africa. I thank you very much. Uh, I thank His Excellency President uh, Museveni for his statement. Uh, and I also thank, by the way, uh, all the leaders for staying within their time. Uh, I invite the distinguished President of the People's Republic of China, His Excellency Mr. Hu Jintao, to take the floor. Mr. President, dear colleagues, The current international security environment is complex and fluid. Nuclear proliferation remains a pressing issue, and nuclear disarmament a long and arduous task. To realize a safer world for all, we must first and foremost remove the threat of nuclear war. 
I wish to propose in this connection that we make efforts in the following five areas. First, maintain global strategic balance and stability and vigorously advance nuclear disarmament. All nuclear weapon states should fulfill in good faith obligations under Article 6 of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and publicly undertake not to seek permanent possession of nuclear weapons. Countries with the largest nuclear arsenals should continue to take the lead in making drastic and substantive reductions in their nuclear weapons. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty should be brought into force at an early date. And negotiations on the Fissile Material Cut-off Treaty should start as soon as possible. When conditions are ripe, other nuclear weapon states should also join the multilateral negotiations on nuclear disarmament. To attain the ultimate goal of complete and thorough nuclear disarmament, the international community should develop at an appropriate time a viable long-term plan composed of phased actions, including the conclusion of a convention on the complete prohibition of nuclear weapons. Second, abandon the nuclear deterrence policy based on first use of nuclear weapons and take credible steps to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. All nuclear weapon states should make an unequivocal commitment of unconditionally not using or threatening to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states or nuclear weapon free zones and conclude a legally binding international instrument in this regard. In the meantime, nuclear weapon states should negotiate and conclude a treaty on no first use of nuclear weapons against one another. Third, consolidate the international nuclear non-proliferation regime and prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons. All countries should join the NPT and real efforts should be made to uphold and enhance its authority and effectiveness. The function of the International Atomic Energy Agency in safeguards should be strengthened. All countries should strictly comply with non-proliferation obligations, refrain from double standards, and tighten and improve export control to prevent proliferation. Fourth, fully respect the right of all countries to peaceful use of nuclear energy and carry out active international cooperation. Developed countries should actively assist developing countries in developing and using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. The IAEA should increase input to promote technical cooperation and assistance in nuclear power, nuclear safety and security, and nuclear technology application. Fifth, take strong measures to enhance nuclear security and reduce nuclear risks. Countries should act in strict observance of all international legal instruments governing nuclear security, take credible steps to ensure the security of their nuclear facilities and materials, and prevent the diversion of nuclear materials with effective means. The international community should intensify cooperation and combat nuclear terrorism through concerted efforts. China has consistently stood for the complete prohibition and thorough destruction of nuclear weapons. I wish to take this opportunity to solemnly reiterate that China is firmly committed to a nuclear strategy of self-defense. We have adhered to the policy of no first use of nuclear weapons at any time and under any circumstance, and made the unequivocal commitment that we will unconditionally not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states or nuclear weapon-free zones. China does not participate in any form of nuclear arms race. We will continue to keep our nuclear capabilities at the minimum level required for national security, make efforts to advance the international nuclear disarmament process. 
China will continue to play a constructive role in upholding the international nuclear non-proliferation regime. Thank you, Mr. President. President Hu for his statement, and I now invite the distinguished President of the French Republic, His Excellency Mr. Nicolas Sarkozy, to take the floor. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, France fully supports your initiative of holding this meeting and all the efforts that are underway with Russia to reduce nuclear arsenals. But let's be candid. We're here to secure peace. We're right to talk about the future, but before the future, there's the present. And the president, the president m means two major proliferation crises. The peoples of the world are listening to us. Our promises, the commitments we make, the speeches we are making. But we're living in a real world, not a virtual world. We are saying, yes, reductions. And President Obama himself has said, I dream of a world where there would be no such weapons. And yet, right in front of us, two countries are doing exactly the opposite, right now. At this very moment, Iran, since 2005, has flouted five Security Council resolutions. Five. Since 2005, the international community has called upon Iran to dialogue. There was a proposal in 2005. A dialogue was proposed again in 2006, again in 2007, again in 2008, and yet another one in April 2009. I support the extended hand of the Americans, President Obama. We must bring these dialogue proposals. But what has it brought the international community? Nothing at all. Just more enriched uranium, more centrifugal machines, and in addition, last but not least, a declaration by the leaders of Iran, a proposal to wipe a UN member state off the map. What are we doing about that? What are we to think? What conclusion are we to draw? There comes a moment when stubborn facts will compel us to take a decision. If we want a world without nuclear weapons in the end, let us not accept violations of international rules. I completely understand the different positions of all those present. But we may all be threatened one day by a neighbor, by a neighbor endowing itself with nuclear weapons. And then we have North Korea, and here it's even better. North Korea has been acting in defiance of all Security Council decisions since 1993. They pay no attention whatsoever to what the international community has to say. Better yet, they continue to test their ballistic missiles. Now, how can we accept this? What conclusions are we to draw? I have to say that here again, whatever our positions may be otherwise, there will come a moment when we'll have to agree and take sanctions. And the decisions of the Security Council and of the United Nations will have to be followed by results. I agree with the President of Uganda and the President of China about access to civilian uses of nuclear energy. And we, the nuclear powers, must accept the transfer of technology so that everyone has access to clean energy. And that 
will make it possible to obviate the arguments of those who claim to be doing research for civilian uses when in fact it is for military uses. So while fully supporting everything that's been decided in the resolution and totally welcoming President Obama's initiative, what I believe is that if we have the courage to affirm and impose sanctions together against those who violate resolutions of the Security Council, we will be lending credibility to our commitment towards a world with fewer nuclear weapons and ultimately with no nuclear weapons. Thank you. His Excellency, uh, President Sarkozy, for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished President of Burkina Faso, His Excellency, Mr. Blaise Compaori, to uh, take the floor. Mr. President, distinguished council members, ladies and gentlemen, today's uh, meeting of the council is dealing with a major theme uh, in light of the current challenges in nonproliferation and nuclear disarmaments. Mr. President, this meeting is timely because poten the potential risk of the destruction of our planet uh, is great and takes many uh, f forms. Therefore, I would like to express my appreciation to the U.S. delegation for taking this initiative of organizing this debate. Mr. President, international security uh, means that we must uh, eliminate all nuclear arsenals and uh, tests. We would call for strict compliance with the NPT and nonproliferation. The devastating irreversible effects of nuclear weapons should give us one more source of motivation. Mr. President, collective security implies respect by all of international norms, of the values of justice and equity. We also need to do some deeper thinking in the following areas. How to persuade states to give up acquiring WMDs at a time when nuclear programs are being developed and tests are being carried out by other countries. How do you conceive a civilian nuclear program without causing suspicion and mistrust? How do you prevent nuclear materials from falling into rough and irresponsible hands? Stopping the illicit trafficking of nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons by non-state actors or terrorist groups is, in fact, a credible threat for all of mankind. Therefore, it's important to pool and to intensify our efforts to provide for the effective implementation of measures taken to combat this scourge. Our collective responsibility has been engaged, of course, and we must therefore assume it fully with courage and perseverance. The mobilization of all states of regional and sub-regional organizations, of civil society and the leaders of public opinion is vital. The just, transparent, and responsible implementation of resolutions will contribute to reducing antagonisms, tensions, and especially will help restore confidence among all nations. Similarly, a more rational use of instruments and mechanisms, uh, such as the NPT, the CDBT, and the Disarmament Conference, all of this will help make the planet safer. Mr. President, your dedication to building a world free of nuclear threats, as well as the dynamic engaged between the USA and the Russian Federation, will help us succeed in our negotiations in terms of reducing nuclear arsenals in the two countries. Mr. President, the establishment of the IAEA met the need to uh, save the world from the deleterious use of uh, the atom and to benefit from nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Now more than ever, we must invest in this. We must support the agency at, and make civilian nuclear energy, which every state has a right to, an effective developmental tool. 
This is the will to justify the adoption in 1996 of the Palindaba Treaty, bringing in a nuclear weapons free zone in Africa. With the energy crisis, a chance should be given to African states to have access to a nuclear energy for civilian purposes. Mr. President, the question of non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament is at the heart of the issue of maintaining international peace and security. The Security Council has a particular role to play herein. Under the UN Charter, it must assume this with objectivity and effectiveness. Mr. President, well aware of the force of your convictions, your personal commitment for multilateralism, your opinions, and your courageous initiatives on disarmament, I remain convinced that you will be able to assume the necessary leadership for the implementation of the deliberations uh, today. And in, along these lines, you will have Burkina Faso's full uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency President uh, Campo Ore uh, for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, His Excellency the Right Honorable Gordon Brown, to take the floor. With the um, unanimous agreement uh, today, with the leadership of President Obama, and with the great speeches that have been made around this table, uh, we are sending a united, unequivocal, an undivided message across the world today that we as leaders of nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states are together committed to creating the conditions for a world free from nuclear weapons. And today's meeting is also a recognition that we are at a decisive moment. We face the risks of a new and dangerous era of new state nuclear weapon holders and perhaps even non-state nuclear weapon holders. So as we prepare for next year's summit in Washington and the review conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and I'm pleased to say with the advice that we have received uh, from great statesmen who are here today, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Perry, Mr. Kissinger, and Mr. Nunn, as well as all the countries around this table, I believe we should be prepared to act now to renew and refresh for our times the global bargain that is at the heart of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's a bargain under which we affirm the rights and responsibilities of those countries which forgo nuclear weapons, and it's a bargain under which there are tough responsibilities to be discharged by nuclear weapon states. And I think there are three elements to the renewal of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. First, we have to be clear that civil nuclear power remains an essential part of any solution to the challenges of climate change and energy security, that that means that access to this affordable, safe, and dependable energy source must be expanded. And as we have heard from Africa today, we should be prepared to offer access to civil nuclear power to non-nuclear weapon states. In doing so, I believe we must, as an international community, be completely confident that we are able to ensure effective mechanisms for multilateral control of the entire fuel cycle, safeguarding fissile material, preventing proliferation with tough and immediate sanctions for those who break the rules. Our country has recently published ideas on how this might be done and how we might establish a new partnership between industry, academia and governments to solve the technical and policy challenges in this area. And I hope others will join us in this work. And second, accompanied with access of non-nuclear power states to civil nuclear power, we must strengthen the non-proliferation regime. For increased access to civil nuclear power must not mean increased risk of further proliferation of nuclear weapons. I believe the lesson of recent months is we cannot stand by when Iran and North Korea reject the opportunities of peaceful civil nuclear power and instead take steps to develop nuclear weapons in a way that threatens regional peace and security. Today, I believe we have to draw a line in the sand. Iran must not allow its actions to prevent the international community from moving forward to a more peaceful era. And as evidence of its breach of international agreements grows, we must now consider far tougher sanctions together. 
I believe that in future the onus of proof must be on those who breach the non-proliferation treaty and we must give the International Atomic Energy Authority the resources it requires to meet and discharge its responsibilities. I hope we can also make more progress on securing entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and make real advances on a fissile material cutoff treaty. And we must make collective action together to enhance nuclear security globally to ensure terrorist groups cannot get access to nuclear materials. And I warmly welcome President Obama's initiative to hold a summit on nuclear security next year. Today, the United Kingdom has deposited with the United Nations our instrument of ratification of the Convention on Nuclear Terrorism and I hope other countries will follow. But there is a third obligation in these future negotiations. Nuclear armed states must pursue active disarmament with a credible roadmap that will command the confidence of all the non-nuclear weapon states. We should commit to making irreversible the steps on disarmament we've already taken. We should work together to map out the next steps on the road to the elimination of nuclear weapons. Credibility is the key, and the International Atomic Energy Authority already undertakes detailed inspection. We need to be more transparent if we are rapidly and verifiably to reduce nuclear weapons globally. Now, the United Kingdom has already taken some major steps towards disarmament, reducing by 75% the explosive power of our stockpile. France has made important progress too. And of course, the United States and Russia have made strong progress on new, in, in negotiating a new START treaty. The current plan to reduce warhead stockpiles to less than 1,500 should in our view be followed by further reductions of all nuclear weapon types. Thereafter, we believe in expanding the talks to include all other countries. Britain is determined to play its part in full, making our deterrent part of a broader negotiation, and we stand ready to participate and to act. And I pledge today that the United Kingdom will retain only the absolute minimum credible and continuing nuclear deterrent capability. And as a demonstration of that pledge, I can say that today, subject to technical analysis and to progress in multilateral negotiations, my aim is that when the next class of submarines enter service in the mid-2020s, our fleet should be reduced from four boats to three. I have therefore directed our National Security Committee to report to me before the end of this year. This conference today recognizes we are at a watershed moment. The choices being made now by each nation will determine whether we face a future arm race or a future of arms control. But if we rise to this challenge, then our generation, our generation that has known all too often only the horrors of conflict and the perils of proliferation, will be remembered not for the years of tension, but for the years of progress. And we will, remembered, we, we will be remembered for the time we came together to secure the future of our world for generations to come. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Prime Minister Brown for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished Prime Minister of Japan, His Excellency Mr. Yukio Hatoyama, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to President Obama for his timely initiative to hold this meeting. On August 6th and 9th this year, I visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki and spoke in person with atomic bomb survivors and their second and third generation descendants. I could not help feeling choked with emotion at the fact that just two atomic bombs claimed more than 200,000 lives and seeing people who still suffer from the after effects of radiation over 60 years after the bombings. I would like to encourage all leaders of the world to visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki and absorb with their own eyes and ears the cruelty of nuclear weapons. As a matter of historical fact, Japan chose not to possess nuclear weapons even after achieving its post-war reconstruction. In 1970, Japan signed the NPT and ratified it six years later. In 1996, Japan signed the CTBT and ratified it a year later. Why has Japan chosen to walk a non-nuclear path when it has the potential to develop nuclear arms? Japan is the only country 
that has suffered from atomic bombings. However, Japan has chosen this path to prevent the vicious cycle of a nuclear arms race. Japan made this choice because it saw moral responsibility in doing so as the only victim of nuclear bombings. Each time neighboring countries take further steps in nuclear development, some suspect that Japan might want to go nuclear. It is only because they do not understand our firm determination not to acquire nuclear weapons and to fulfill our responsibility to act as the state to have suffered from atomic bombings. I hereby renew Japan's firm commitment to the three non-nuclear principles. However, it is not sufficient for Japan to just renounce the position of nuclear weapons. Despite our wish for the elimination of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon holding states still possess a large amount of nuclear arsenal, and the world remains under the threat of nuclear proliferation. It is the harsh reality that efforts for nuclear non-proliferation have come to a critical moment in the face of challenges such as the nuclear issue of the DPRK and Iran, and the risk of terrorists acquiring nuclear material and technology. Thus, Japan should take the lead in the pursuit of the elimination of nuclear weapons. The vision for a world without nuclear weapons proposed by President Obama this April has encouraged and inspired people around the world. It is high time for us to take action. First, Japan calls upon nuclear weapon holding states to reduce their nuclear arsenals. Progress in ensuring transparency and in disclosing information would enable confidence building, creating a virtuous cycle for further nuclear disarmament. The creation of a nuclear weapon-free zone, when coordinated between the five nuclear weapon states, P5, and non-nuclear weapon states in the region, would also contribute to nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, and consequently to global and regional peace and security as stated in today's resolution. Second, Japan strongly encourages the early entry into force of the CTBT and the immediate commencement of negotiations on a fissile material cutoff treaty. I recall that a Japanese fishing boat named Daigo Fukuryu Maru encountered the hydrogen bomb testing in the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific on March 4th in 1954, freezing the capability of nuclear hubs to produce nuclear weapons by an FMCT would contribute to both nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. It also constitutes an indispensable measure to make the NPT regime more universally equitable. We have no time to waste. Third, Japan itself will engage in active diplomacy to lead international efforts in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. For example, Japan will submit a draft resolution on nuclear disarmament to the UN General Assembly, support the activities of the International Commission of Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, co-chaired by Madame Kawaguchi of Japan and Mr. Evans of Australia, and promote efforts to strengthen the skills, expertise, and resources of the IAEA. I wish to express my respect for the role played by IAEA Director General Albardai. I also wish to express my trusted confidence in and strong support for the soon-to-be new Director General, Ambassador Amano. Fourth, Japan will take resolute response to nuclear proliferation activities. The DPRK's nuclear development poses a grave threat to the peace and security of Japan and the international community and must not be tolerated. Japan will take necessary measures 
to implement the UN Security Council Resolution 1874 more effectively. Japan is also concerned about the nuclear issue of Iran. In this regard, the UN Security Council plays an increasingly important role, and Japan calls for the strengthening of the Council. Furthermore, Japan will contribute to the Nuclear Security Summit to be held next year. Fifth, as stated in the resolution adopted today, it is necessary to reduce the risk of proliferation and to adhere to the highest level of standard in each area of nuclear safeguards, security, and safety when using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. The period up to the NPT review conference in May next year will be critically important in testing the ability of the international community to take pragmatic steps forward towards nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. All the nations of the world, with or without nuclear weapons, have the responsibility to take action towards nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished Prime Minister of the Republic of Turkey, uh, His Excellency Recep Tayyip Erdogan, to take the floor. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, it gives me distinct pleasure to be here today. And uh, let me, at the outset of my remarks, extend my sincere thanks to President Obama for his initiative to convene this UN Security Council summit focusing on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, as well as nuclear safety and security. The summit gives us an opportunity uh, to discuss these issues which require uh, global attention and attention at the highest level. And uh, these uh, factors make this meeting very pertinent and timely. We have a common responsibility vis-a-vis -vis humanity on these subjects. Mr. President, 40 years ago, when the threat of nuclear destruction was hovering over the fortunes of mankind in greater magnitude than today, leaders of the world were united to come up with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was indisputably one of the most important treaties of the 20th century. This. Uh, it, this treaty is very important because it reflects mankind's universal and fundamental desire for peace and security. And today, it remains as relevant and indispensable as it was 40 years ago with its three mutually reinforcing pillars, non-proliferation, nuclear disarmament, general and complete disarmament, and peaceful use of nuclear energy. Over the years, much has been achieved along these lines. However, the need, there is still the need to bolster the integrity and credibility of the NPT regime. Therefore, I believe that uh, today's meeting is going to be an important uh, opportunity to demonstrate our readiness to uh, achieve these goals and demonstrate a strong global ownership. And I believe that it will re-energize the international community and lead to new initiatives towards the NPT Review Conference next year. Mr. President, um, there is a need for an incremental and sustained approach with respect to nuclear disarmament. In this regard, the treaty in this regard, the unequivocal undertaking by all five nuclear states to accomplish the total elimination of their nuclear arsenals is therefore one of the big achievements of NPT. This responsibility now must be upheld, building on Article 6 of the treaty and the 13 practical steps for nuclear disarmament agreed upon in the year 2000. It is in this context that we welcome the and encourage the efforts to replace the start with a new legally binding instrument. Irreversible progress 
on nuclear disarmament will also reinforce the other two pillars of the NPT. In particular, it is important uh, that a nuclear non-proliferation should go hand in hand with nuclear disar disarmament efforts. And, uh, this will inc should include into force uh, of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, initiation of negotiations for a fissile material cutoff treaty in the Conference on Disarmament, and promoting IAEA's role as the sole multilateral body in advancing safe and peaceful use of nuclear technology. Turkey believes that, uh, on the other hand, states in full compliance with their safeguard obligations should enjoy unfettered access to civilian nuclear energy as enshrined in the NPT. We believe that having uh, weapons of mass destruction in this day and age is not going to bring additional safety or security to any country. To the contrary, they are in danger uh, peace and stability. It is for that reason that Turkey believes that it is very important to have um, nuclear-free zones, especially and starting with the Middle East, and we continue to support such activities um, in all areas, particularly in the Middle East. It is also very important that safety uh, of nuclear resources remains to be a priority issue for the international community. There is no doubt that confidence in nuclear, energy, uh, nuclear sources will continue to be very important. On the other hand, nuclear terrorism and illicit trafficking in nuclear material poses a grave security threat that needs to be addressed with a global commitment. Within this framework, we should work on a comprehensive and mutually reinforcing approach with the utilization of available UN and IAEA conventions as well as applicable multilateral instruments. The UN Security Council Resolution 1540 and its effective implementation is thus of great importance. Mr. President, I would like to take this opportunity to say that we support the uh, resolution which we have voted on against this background. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Prime Minister uh, Erdogan uh, for his statement. Uh, I now invite the distinguished permanent representative of the Libyan Arab Jamahere, His Excellency Mr. Abdurrahman Mohammed uh, Salgam, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President Barack Obama, Heads of State and Government, Secretary General, Director General El Baradiyai. At the outset, allow me to express the appreciation of the Libyan delegation uh, to hold this summit and for preparing the draft resolution we just voted on. Mr. President, my country undertook a historic initiative when it voluntarily ceased production of the nuclear bomb it was on the verge of producing. It thus made a very good service to international peace and security. The decision was taken proceeding from the deep belief in the primacy of mankind's peace over any limited national motivations. Libya deserves the thanks and appreciation of the world. Libya must be helped uh, to use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Indeed, furthermore, uh, Libya, because of uh, this great motivation to maintain international peace and security, Libya deserves a permanent seat in the Security Council because of its great service to international peace and security. Mr. President, all states have the right to develop their capabilities to use nuclear energy and to enrich nuclear fuel, however, for peaceful purposes only. States must be encouraged to use nuclear energy for peaceful means. However, 
the world cannot accept attempts by any states to produce nuclear weapons. Mr. President, as Brother Leader Muammar al-Qaddafi stated before the General Assembly yesterday, the International Agency for uh, Atomic Energy must inspect all states, including those uh, uh, possessing nuclear weapons. Its role must not be limited to non-nuclear states alone. If we wish the agency to be a truly effective international agency. However, if its role is limited to non-nuclear states, the agency will lose its global character. The agency must monitor all states without exception. We want the Middle East to be a nuclear weapon-free zone, a fully free zone. However, Mr. President, uh, the Israeli Dimona uh, nuclear plant must be inspected. Israel cannot be, uh, remain above the law. IAEA must uh, have open access to Dimona. Otherwise, all the states of the Middle East will say, we have the right to acquire nuclear weapons. Why Israel alone? Mr. President, uh, nuclear energy is just an other type of energy, just like oil and natural gas. States requiring uh, energy, as uh, uh, President Museveni stated, must be helped to use this important source of energy, however, for peaceful purposes alone. At the same time, we cannot uh, accept the use of such energy as a weapon threatening mankind. In conclusion, we support uh, uh, the paper presented by the Non-Aligned Group to the summit, and I thank you, Mr. President, for your initiative, and let me express our appreciation uh, for uh, the uh, U.S. delegation in preparing the draft resolution we voted upon this morning. Thank you, sir. I thank His Excellency Ambassador Salgam uh, for his statement. Uh, I shall now give the floor to the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mr. Mohamed Obaradeh, in accordance with Rule 39 of the Provisional Rules of Procedure of the Council. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, thank you for inviting me to address this timely and, I hope, groundbreaking summit. I'd like to thank you for taking this courageous initiative, an initiative that rekindles hope for a world at peace with itself and a security system that is balanced, equitable, and humane. I will limit myself to a few key issues. First, the global nuclear non-proliferation regime is fragile and has many shortcomings. The IAEA legal authority is severely limited in some countries. This is because many states have not concluded the required agreement with the agency. As a result, in over 90 states, the agency either has no verification authority at all or its authority is inadequate. That means we often cannot verify whether a country is engaged in clandestine nuclear activities. Furthermore, our verification mandate is centered on nuclear material. If the agency is to be expected to pursue possible weaponization activities, it must be empowered with the corresponding legal authority. A second issue is the growing number of states that have mastered uranium enrichment or plutonium reprocessing. Any one of these states could develop nuclear weapons in a very short span of time if, for example, it decided to withdraw from the NPT. To address this, I believe that we need to move from national to multinational control of the nuclear fuel cycle. As a first step, I have proposed the establishment of a low-enriched uranium bank to assure states a guaranteed supply of nuclear fuel for the reactors so that they might not need their own enrichment or reprocessing capability. A number of complementary proposals have also been made in that regard. Our ultimate goal, however, should be the full multinationalization of the fuel cycle as we move towards nuclear disarmament. A third issue is providing the highest level of security for nuclear and radioactive material. In my view, the biggest risk the world faces today is of extremists getting hold of such material. More than 200 incidents of illicit trafficking, losses or thefts 
were reported to the IA last year. And this might be only the tip of the iceberg. We need to intensify our effort to secure vulnerable nuclear and radioactive material. And the, your initiative to secure such a material within four years could not come anytime sooner. A fourth issue is the need to strengthen the IA. I should emphasize that at the current level of funding, the IA will not be able to fulfill its mission in nuclear verification and security. The agency infrastructure is dilapidated and we lack state-of-the-art technology key to modern-day verification. A fifth issue is that the IA cannot do its work in isolation. It depends on a supportive political process with the Security Council at its core. The Council needs to develop a comprehensive compliance mechanism to address in a consistent and systematic manner cases of non-compliance with safeguard obligations or of countries withdrawing from the NPT. This should include giving the agency the additional authority it may need to deal with the specific cases. A sixth issue is that the Security Council must put more emphasis on addressing the insecurities that lie behind many cases of proliferation, such as endemic conflict, security imbalances, and lack of trust. Finally, I'm grateful to see nuclear disarmament back on the top of the international agenda. And I would like to pay my gra express my gratitude to the four horsemen, Schultz, Kissinger, Nunn, and Perry, for their pioneering work and statesmanship and their contribution to make this environment a reality. I'm also grateful to see a recognition of the intrinsic link between nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, an idea you, Mr. President, have expressed quite often. By demonstrating their irreversible commitment to achieving a world free from nuclear weapons, the weapon states can greatly contribute to the legitimacy of the non-proliferation regime and gain the moral authority to call on the rest of the world to curb the proliferation of these inhumane weapons. To turn the ideas discussed today into action will require an environment of mutual trust, which I hope this summit will help to create. Thank you very much. I thank uh, Mr. Alverde for his statement. Uh, there are no other speakers inscribed on my list. Uh, I want to thank all the participants for their contributions to this meeting. Uh, my thanks go particularly to all the distinguished heads of state and government, uh, the Secretary General, uh, the Director General of the IAEA. Uh, the statements that we heard today, I think, affirm uh, our commitment to a difficult but achievable goal. Uh, and uh, I am inspired and encouraged by the seriousness with which uh, all of you have approached this question. Uh, I am extraordinarily encouraged by the unanimous adoption of the resolution. Uh, words alone will not get the job done, but us having affirmed uh, our stated goal, uh, I'm confident that if we are diligent that we can, in fact, move this process forward and provide the sort of peace and security for our children and our grandchildren that all of us uh, so desperately want. So. Uh, I want to thank all of you again uh, for your participation. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. It reflects the agenda I outlined in Prague and builds on a consensus that all nations have the right to peaceful nuclear energy, that nations with nuclear weapons have the responsibility to move toward disarmament, <laughs> and those without them had the responsibility to forsake them. Today, the Security Council endorsed a global effort to lock down all vulnerable nuclear materials within four years. The United States will host a summit next April to advance this goal and help all nations achieve it. This resolution will also help strengthen the institutions and initiatives that combat the smuggling, financing, and theft of prolifer uh, proliferation-related materials. It calls on all states to freeze any financial assets that are being used for proliferation, and it calls for stronger safeguards to reduce the likelihood that peaceful nuclear weapons programs can be diverted to a weapons program. That peaceful nuclear programs can be diverted to a weapons program. 
The resolution we pass today will also strengthen the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We have made it clear that the Security Council has both the authority and the responsibility to respond to violations to this treaty. We've made it clear that the Security Council has both the authority and responsibility to determine and respond as necessary when violations of this treaty threaten international peace and security. That includes full compliance with Security Council resolutions on Iran and North Korea. Let me be clear, this is not about singling out individual nations. It is about standing up for the rights of all nations who do live up to their responsibilities. The world must stand together, and we must demonstrate that international law is not an empty promise and that treaties will be enforced. The next 12 months will be absolutely critical in determining whether this resolution and our overall efforts to stop the spread and use of nuclear weapons are successful. And all nations must do their part to make this work. In America, I have promised that we will pursue a new agreement with Russia to substantially reduce our strategic warheads and launchers. We will move forward with the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Draft Resolution contained in document S-2009-473. Please raise their hand. The results of the voting is as follows. Uh, the draft resolution is received. Unanimously, 15 votes in favor. Uh, the draft uh, resolution has been adopted unanimously as Resolution 1887 of 2009. I want to thank again everybody who is in attendance. I wish you all good morning. In the six-plus decades that this Security Council has been in existence, only four other meetings of this nature have been convened. I called for this one so that we may address, at the highest level, a fundamental threat to the security of all peoples and all nations, the spread and use of nuclear weapons. As I said yesterday, this very institution was founded at the dawn of the atomic age, in part because man's capacity to kill had to be contained. And although we averted a nuclear nightmare during the Cold War, we now face proliferation of a scope and complexity that demands new strategies and new approaches. Just one nuclear weapon exploded in a city, be it New York or Moscow, Tokyo or Beijing, London or Paris, could kill hundreds of thousands of people. And it would badly destabilize our security, our economies, and our very way of life. Once more, the United Nations has a pivotal role to play in preventing this crisis. The historic resolution we just adopted enshrines our shared commitment to the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. And it brings Security Council agreement on a broad framework for action to reduce nuclear dangers as we work toward that goal. Speaking in the chamber, I shall now invite the distinguished Secretary General, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished heads of state and government, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, this is a historic moment, a moment offering a fresh start toward a new future. President Obama, a warm welcome, and we salute your leadership. This is the first Security Council summit on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. I have long advocated a stronger role for the Security Council this was a major element of the five-point nuclear disarmament plan I announced October last year. The need for action is clear. The thousands of nuclear weapons remain on hair trigger list a lot. More states have sought and acquired them. Nuclear tests have continued. And every day, we live with the threat that weapons of mass de destruction could be stolen, sold, or slip away. As long as such weapons exist, so does the risk of proliferation and catastrophic use. So too uh, does the threat of nuclear terrorism. Now, some might dismiss the goal of nuclear disarmament 
as utopian. The cynics say, stop dreaming, be, be realistic. They are wrong. Nuclear disarmament is the only sane path uh, to a safer world. Nothing would work better in eliminating the risk of use than eliminating the weapons themselves. The Russian Federation and the United States are leading by example. I urge the Security Council to make the most of this moment. They should, be, they should not be a one-time event. We must sustain the momentum. First, we need to new ways to increase the transparency and openness regarding the weapons programs of the recognized nuclear weapon states. I urge the Council to start. The 6,191st meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is before the Council in document S slash agenda slash 6,191, which reads, quote, maintenance of international peace and security, nuclear proliferation, and nuclear disarmament. Unless I hear any objection, I shall consider the agenda adopted. Agenda is adopted. I wish to warmly welcome the distinguished heads of state and government, the general, uh, the secretary general, the director general of the IAEA, ministers and other distinguished representatives present in the Security Council chamber. Your presence is an affirmation of the importance of the subject matter to be discussed. Uh, the Security Council Summit will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. Members of the Council have before them document S slash 2009 slash 473, which contains the text of a draft resolution prepared in the course of the Council's prior consultations. I wish to draw council members' attention to document S slash 2009 slash 463, containing a letter dated 16 September 2009 from the United States of America, transmitting a concept paper on the item under consideration. In accordance with the understanding reached earlier among members, the Security Council will take action on the draft resolution before it prior to hearing statements from the Secretary General and Council members. Accordingly, I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favor of the ban treaty and open the door to deeper cuts in our own arsenal? In January, we will call upon countries to begin negotiations on a treaty to end the production of fissile material for weapons. And the Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference in May will strengthen that agreement. Now, we harbor no illusions about the difficulty of bringing about a world without nuclear weapons. We know there are plenty of cynics and that there will be setbacks to prove their point. But there will also be days like today that push us forward, days that tell a different story. It is the story of a world that understands that no difference or division is worth destroying all that we have built and all that we love. It is a recognition that can bring people of different nationalities and ethnicities and ideologies together. In my own country, it has brought Democrats and Republican leaders together, uh, leaders like George Shultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, who are with us here today. And it was a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, who once articulated the goal we now seek in the starkest of terms. I quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And no matter how great the obstacles may seem, we must never stop our efforts to reduce the weapons of war. We must never stop until all we must never stop at all until we see the day when nuclear arms have been banished from the face of the earth. That is our task. That can be our destiny. And we will leave this meeting with a renewed determination to achieve this shared goal. Thank you. In accordance with 
the understanding reached among Council members. I wish to remind all speakers to limit their statements to no more than five minutes in order to enable the Council to carry on its work ex expeditiously. Uh, delegations with length lengthy statements are kindly requested to circulate the text in writing and to deliver a condensed version when 